So the original title of this video was going to be something along the lines of i5-8600K slash 8400 versus R5-2600X slash 2600. You guys get the point, right? A typical benchmark video, but if you tech tubers already beat me to that, I'm still going to throw those benchmarks in this video, but I want to focus more or less on something that hasn't been covered very much yet, and that is XFR 2.0. On the DL, XFR stands for Extended Frequency Range, and it does just that. It allows the CPU to clock higher than the advertised turbo boost, so it's almost like a turbo boost on top of a turbo boost, which is a bit confusing, but XFR 2.0 will usually kick in if you have an adequate cooling solution. So if you have a beefy enough air cooler or AIO or a custom loop, then XFR 2.0 will be able to take full advantage of that extra overclocking headroom you might otherwise have on a Ryzen 2 chip. I just called it Ryzen 2 and technically Zen Plus is not Ryzen 2. At least AMD doesn't refer to their own architecture that way, so I really don't think we should if we want to be consistent with what they're showing us. So what I should have said was Zen Plus, or Ryzen 2nd Generation. I don't know, these naming schemes are getting really stupid. Anyway, the topic of today's video, I'm going to compare the R5-2600X to itself with XFR 2.0 enabled versus a manual overclock to 4.2 GHz, yes, on a B350 board, albeit with slightly crispy VRM temps, but everything seems stable. Nothing was overheating during the 30 or so minutes of uh, just straight up benchmarking all of these games. I have about a dozen or so included in this video, also some synthetics, and I also uh, decided to throw in another Adobe Premiere render so you guys can see how productive the CPU actually is in the real world when it comes to content creation. Something I want to mention though before jumping into these graphs, the R5-2600X in my benchmarks in particular, this is a good reason for this, I'll explain it in a second, sometimes outperforms the R7-2700X in games. Not in, you know, workload scenarios where you're either rendering a video or using Blender or Handbrake or what have you. Obviously, the higher core count chip will come out on top there, all other things equal. And for the most part, they were. But here's the distinction. Here's why, in some cases for the games, the R5 comes out on top with my benchmarks. It's because the R7 was overclocked manually to 4.2 gigahertz across all cores. Now, the R5 was not manually overclocked. Save the RAM frequency, which I and enabled that to be profile for, so 3200 megahertz on the RAM, uh, timings of I think 16, 18, 18, I wanna say. Uh, that is all I changed. And then I left the CPU frequency, V core, base clock, all of that unchanged. Again, in a B350 BIOS, the 2600X one in a few cases because of XFR 2.0. And what happens is this, XFR 2.0 allows certain cores for very small amounts of time to turbo to a higher frequency than what I could manually get all of my cores on the 2700X simultaneously to. So 4.2 gigahertz was it across all cores. I didn't do per core overclocking, just all eight at 4.2. And what that does is essentially offset any potential you know, overclock you could have on a single core. So maybe I could hit 4.4 gigahertz on core one, but then 4.1 gigahertz on the other seven cores, right? I didn't do that because that's a very case specific scenario. But with XFR 2.0 enabled for any of those Zen Plus CPUs that aren't manually overclocked, the turbo frequencies at any given time can be slightly higher than 4.2 gigahertz. And because of this, and also because of the fact that many games aren't optimized for six cores, let alone eight cores and 16 threads, the 2600 occasionally comes out on top. And that's why I'm willing to say in this video that if you play video games primarily with your Zen Plus CPU, then you might want to give manual overclocking a second thought. Is it really necessary? I don't think so. In fact, I think you'll be better off in many cases when it comes to games with just letting XFR do its thing. Now today's test bench is exactly the same as it was three days ago when I benchmarked the 2700X. So a 1070 Ti from EVGA, 16 gigs of DDR4 clocked to 3200 megahertz, and depending on the platform, either a Z370 or X470 motherboard, with the exception of, again, the 2600X, which I used a B350 motherboard for, more or less just to prove a point, right? That you don't need the most expensive motherboard out there to hit the overclocks that you desire. By the way, a few of you tried to point out that my 1070 Ti in the test bench was somehow a massive bottleneck and that all my frame rates are being skewed as a result. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. First off, the 1070 Ti is a, an insanely powerful card. Okay? It's, it's nothing to just look at and go, meh, it's not bad at all. In fact, if we compare it to last-gen architecture, right, Maxwell stuff, the 1070 Ti is more powerful than the 980 Ti. So by that definition, all of our benchmarks from three years ago were invalid because our graphics card was always the bottleneck. There's always going to be a bottleneck no matter what you do. The idea is to eliminate the graphics card bottleneck as much as possible to leverage the CPUs the most. But then if you scale the graphics card up, all your frame rates should scale about the same, assuming that your graphics card was the bottleneck to begin with. So the logic there just doesn't really add up to me, and that's why I'm using the 1070 Ti. Also, it's just more representative because not everyone has a 1080 Ti, which is the best thing out there. 
these are more real world results. So starting off first with Cinebench R15, I want you to pay very close attention to the X axis where all of the CPUs and their respective frequencies are listed. As you can see, the 1700X from AMD reached four gigahertz. That was the highest overclock I could attain with it. 1690 in the multi-core side is not bad at all. It was by far though, the lowest scoring single core performer. The 2700X, which is essentially the step up, right? A generation above was able to reach 4.2 gigahertz with the X470 motherboard that jumped our single core performance up to 184 and then 1905 on the multi-core side which is very impressive the 8700k from intel which is by far the best gamer in this lot scored 1684 at 5 gigahertz again not bad and is also the highest scoring single core performer the r5 2600x at stock scored 1397 which isn't bad 186 on the multi-core side and the r5 2600x with a manual overclock to 4.2 gigahertz scored 1489 so we can see how xfr is really only benefiting a few cores, which is why when running at stock, it scored lower on the multi-core side of things. And we can see our lonely i5-8400 on the far right, of course running at stock because it has a locked multiplier, which is a shame. Only 942 on the multi-core side, 176 for the single core. Geekbench 4 tells a similar story, not gonna spend too much time here. The R7-2700X is by far the best multi-core performer. And uh, with a score of 4890 is also the best single core performer. Although the i5-8400 at stock isn't far off, off at 4840 on the far right. Now for Adobe Premiere Pro, more or less a real world render scenario, a five minute 1080p 60fps video file run through the H.264 YouTube 1080p preset resulted in the following times. The i9-7900X at 4.6 gigahertz was the fastest render, but again, not by far. And this CPU is, it's just really not one you should consider because it runs extremely hot. It's very expensive. The platform in general is very expensive. And look, the i7-8700K is not far off at five gigahertz, it runs cooler, the platform is cheaper and yeah, you're just gonna have a better time with this one. But then look to the left again, the R7 2700X is only 10 seconds slower at 4.2 gigahertz. This is a manual overclock. We do expect the manual overclock to benefit us more in these work oriented scenarios. Of course, with games, things will change. You'll see that shortly. The R5 2600X at stock resulted in a 264 second render time. Not too bad, especially when compared to the similarly priced i5 8400 at stock. And if we manually overclock to 4.2 gigahertz across all R5 cores, 260 is our time in seconds. That's just four seconds shaved off going from stock to a manual 4.2 overclock. This kind of shows how Adobe Premiere Pro slightly favors frequency a bit more than core count to an extent. Now these gaming benchmarks are where I think the R5 2600X definitely shines, not only because it's again around $200, which is a, a, an insanely good price for what you're getting, six cores, 12 threads, overclockable, and on cheap platforms too, that is everything you'd ever want in an affordable content creation and gaming oriented platform. So all of these CPUs you see from here on out in these benchmarks were tested at the following frequencies, the 1700X at four gigahertz, the 2700X at 4.2 gigahertz, the 8700K at five gigahertz, and the 2600X left at stock for XFR 2.0 to do its thing. And check out Grand Theft Auto V in the 1080p resolution. The 2600X definitely holds its own, only a four FPS delta between averages with it and the 2700X. And it actually performs better with 0.1% lows, which means the stuttering was less frequent with the cheaper six core counterpart. We see the opposite trend with player unknowns battlegrounds in 1080p. The 2700X holds a 124 average frame rate, 70 on 1% lows and 36 the lowest 0.1% of frames, and the 2600X basically performs neck and neck with the 2700X down to the lowest 0.1% of frames where it falls short by 12 FPS. So a bit more stuttering with the 2600X, I would say the extra cores in this scenario do aid the 2700X despite the frequency difference. Now Fortnite was a bit weird. The 2700X performed better than its 1700X counterpart and the i7 was by far the best performer. We also experienced the highest 0.1 and 1% lows with the i7, but the 2600X performed very well on the average side, actually outperforming the 2700X and also in the 1% lows, but then check out the 0.1% lows, the most stuttering occurred of all four of these CPUs with the 2600X. So I would say that in this case, both the frequency range as well as the limited core count, even though six is plenty, are holding the R5 back. Now Doom was a super weird one. I almost threw this benchmark out because I don't really believe what I'm seeing here. The game did not update again. Everything with these benchmarks is exactly the same, uh, but the R5 actually 
performed better on average than the i7-8700K in OpenGL. These CPUs, by the way, have the same core counts and they both have multi-threading enabled uh, and even down to the 1% and 0.1% lows, the R5 kept up with the 8700K, which is clocked much higher, mind you. So again, in OpenGL, kind of confusing. The 2700X did not do very well at all. I saw a lot of stuttering with that CPU. Uh, so I'm kind of curious as to why the R5 did so much better. This is more or less just an observation. I wouldn't take this one at face value. Take it instead with a grain of salt. Battlefield 1 DirectX 11 1080p Ultra preset. This one's also super interesting. Uh, the R5 and the R7 from Zen Plus are both performing basically neck and neck with each other here. The 2600X actually pulls ahead when it comes to 1% and 0.1% lows and almost matches the i7-8700K at 5 gigahertz. Being that this one's more CPU core oriented, right? Having more cores is definitely better because i5s that are quad core i5s tend to max out CPU utilization with Battlefield 1. I expected this one to be uh, a bit different than what we're seeing here, but this is great news for anyone looking for a budget system, right? The R5 is doing very well right now. Rise of the Tomb Raider and DirectX 12, 1080p high settings, no anti-aliasing resulted in the R7 2700X losing in the first title. This is the peak. It's the first one that you see when you run the benchmark. And the R5 2600X actually basically performing on par with the 1700X and the i7 8700K coming out on top. Something else to note, the R5 2600X basically outperformed in the second scenario, at least the 8700K, the 2700X and the 1700X. So this one was the top dog for the second scenario. The third one, it was a few frames off from the 8700K and still managed to outperform the 2700X. So things again, looking really good here for the 2600X. Now Planet Coaster in 1080p max settings is more or less what I'd expect from these CPUs. Basically neck and neck, the 2700X did have a two frame rate jump over the 2600X, but I would call that within the margin of error and everything else was basically within the same range, two uh, FPS to one FPS with the 0.1% lows. You're seeing a side-by-side -side comparison here of the two and they look practically the same. And that's why 1% and 0.1% lows are so important because they account more or less for the micro stutters that you would otherwise not see if you just saw the average and minimum frame rates. F1 2017 was another weird one just by the way that these two uh, stacked up against each other. The R7 2700X outperformed the R5 by a long shot on average, but the R5 still managed to somehow maintain a 5 FPS lead on the minimum side of things. So Take this with a grain of salt because these aren't 1% and 0.1% lows, but still an interesting observation nonetheless. Universe Sandbox 2 resulted in just 60 FPS on average for the R7 2700X. This is with the Earth and Sphere of Moon simulation, the one I always run in the high setting preset. The R5 2600X scored 11 FPS higher on average. This, I think, is where XFR 2.0 definitely shines. In games that are leveraging two to three cores heavily, you're gonna wanna keep your CPU just at stock settings and let XFR do its thing because if you manually overclock you're hindering your CPU from hitting any higher frequency on a few cores where it matters. And lastly, with Witcher 3, I was able to breathe again. So the 2700X and the 2600X scored basically the exact same score. And this, mind you, is with me manually benchmarking. There's no built-in benchmark with Witcher 3. So I'm kind of just trying to do the same thing in game. And that's why these fluctuate just a little bit. Uh, but 112 FPS on average is great to see for both CPUs because this is so GPU intensive. We don't expect our CPU to make much of a difference up to a certain extent. So there are three things that I ultimately want you to take away from this video. The first is that if you're interested in content creation or doing some CPU intensive tasks that require multiple threads, multiple cores, obviously the R7 CPU is the better bet. But the second point, if you're gonna play primarily games, you're not gonna see much of a difference at all, especially when you don't manually overclock between the R5 2600 or 2600X and the R7 2700 or the 2700X. And third, tying back again into XFR and manually overclocking, if you primarily play video games, you don't need to manually overclock, just let XFR do its thing, because most games we can assume will usually leverage between four and six cores efficiently, leaning more towards four cores still, uh, but eventually we expect six cores to be the mainstream thing, right? And then manually overclocking might benefit a bit more, but for right now, I think that letting XFR do its thing is the better bet for gamers. And even if you content create, look, you saw with the 2600X scenarios at 4.2 gigahertz across the board and XFR 2.0 enabled, uh, you know, one or the other, 
they basically render the video file in exactly the same amount of time. And actually, if you're scrubbing or throwing work stabilizer or doing anything that's more or less like single core oriented, then XFR 2.0 is gonna benefit you more in those scenarios. So even on the content creation side, I don't necessarily see the benefit of overclocking unless, again, you're gonna max out all your threads in those scenarios. So I hope this video at least sheds a bit of light into the true value of Ryzen 5 CPUs, especially with Zen Plus. This is why I've said for the longest time that the R5 1600 is the best bang for the buck CPU because six cores, 12 threads, 200 bucks, and it's overclockable. Boom, it, it plays games fine. It content creates fine. It lets you stream fine. It's the best of everything and it's not very expensive and you don't have to buy an expensive board to overclock the thing. The same goes for the 2600X. The benefit here though is that in some cases you might have slightly higher, slightly lower power draw. So it really didn't change much, even though we got a higher boost frequency out of that. Uh, but at the same time, you don't even need to manually overclock to get the best out of your chip, especially when it comes to most games out there. And that is just a win-win for everybody, right? Ease of use, come on, who doesn't want that? And that's why I'm willing to say that the R5 2600 and 2600X are the best value CPUs I've ever benchmarked on this channel hands down. You just cannot get a better combination of both value and performance from a CPU out there. Unless you buy something from your buddy for 10 bucks, it's worth $100, obviously great value there. But on the, in the new market, right, MSRP prices, these two CPUs are just phenomenal for what they are. Now, if you're concerned about the choice between the 2600 and the 2600X, I, I really can't say too much on it yet because I haven't tested the 2600, but I'm willing to say that if it's anything like the 1600 was with respect to the 1600X, then the 2600 is gonna be the better buy because it's gonna be cheaper. It's not gonna come with as beefy a cooler, so if you want to use a stock cooler, that might influence your decision, and rightfully so. But if you have an aftermarket CPU cooler, uh, like an AIO or a, you know, a bigger air cooler, then I think the 2600 is gonna be the better bet. I'll definitely get my hands on one eventually and we'll confirm that, but for now, I think you're gonna be perfectly fine with the regular 2600, save the extra 30 bucks, buy yourself a nicer CPU cooler, and let that thing just cruise at its turbo frequency. With that, folks, if you like this video, let me know by giving this one a thumbs up. I appreciate that. Thumbs down for the opposite. Click the subscribe button if you haven't already, and that bell notification icon so you get notified when videos like these go live. This is Science Studio. Thanks for benchmarking with us.